Thank you very much, Alex. So I'm very happy to be here uh, today. Uh, and I hope we will uh, be able to uh, cover everything that we wanted. There is about 100 pages here in 45 minutes, <laughs> but uh, we'll try. Okay, so we're very in short, in, in very in, in very short, uh, Innovis is developing LIDARs for autonomous vehicles. Uh, we're very active in, in automotive, trying to pursue autonomous driving level two, level three. We have several um, products that we offer to the market. Uh, but actually here today, uh, we're going to focus on two main topics. One of them is about uh, what our car makers are trying to achieve in developing autonomous vehicle and how we're helping them, uh, not only with the LiDAR, but also with the perception software. That's something that Amir will cover. Uh, you might have heard on Innovis uh, through our program with uh, BMW. We have our LiDAR here, Innovis 1, that's our first generation. Uh, that is going to be part of uh, BMW series production for level three for highway driving. It's going to be used on uh, several models, seven model uh, series, the five series, the iX. We're very fortunate to be part of this program and of course many other things. As I said uh, today, uh, I'll cover I'll cover some topics that are coming from uh, the lidar space. Uh, and talk about possibly uh, some standardization that is required in that space. And later, Amir uh, will translate some of those requirements also taking from the perception software. We have a white paper uh, that uh, we shared on our uh, website. Some of the material that I'm going to cover here very quickly, because we don't have time, uh, is, is explained uh, very in deep uh, in, in that document. So you can find it on our website and I'm sure you'll find it interesting. Today, most of the cars on all of the cars uh, that are uh, trying to do some automation of driving are at uh, level two, meaning that the car controls either the pedals uh, or uh, the, the wheel, uh, but uh, still require the attention of the passenger. Uh, you just probably heard about a car uh, that uh, a person that was accused in killing a person uh, due to an accident in in an autom automated driving, basically because the car makers are still not taking liability. Uh, the quantum leap between level two and level three comes from the car maker actually taking full responsibility on anything that happens uh, when driving and does not require the person to be uh, attentive. It obviously requires them to have much higher confidence and that comes from additional uh, sensors and capabilities. In order to reach a full autonomous uh, driving, you need to have a good visibility, a good prediction on what everything is going on, on on the road. Uh, and there is an eye diagram, a certain way that you need to cover the space uh, with uh, different types of sensors and LiDAR is, is one of them. And, and what you're seeing here is just one, uh, I would say, uh, one way to try to do it with existing solutions in the market. Uh, someone who took uh, specific sensors and tried to map how putting them one next to the other gives you the full uh, visibility that is required by the system. There are other ways uh, to do it. This is just one example. I want to talk about, explain first what is a LiDAR and maybe specifically how we approach this problem. A LiDAR using a, a laser, a laser beam uh, that we uh, move around by using a two axis manner uh, scanning mechanism that allows us to scan the scene. That light is emitted towards a, an object uh, and the light that bounces back uh, to the system, a fraction of the light uh, is collected by the system. Uh, there is a sphere that comes uh, from 200 meters away and you have a certain flux of photons that are collected by the system. The aperture of the system is, you can say it's like an antenna. That's the antenna of the system. It defines how many photons are uh, eventually collected into the system. Those photons are collimated on a detector. And of course, uh, the sensitivity of the system defines how well we are able to um, react to each photon. You want to have the lowest uh, noise figure in order to be able to detect each and every photon. Of course, photons could come from either the object or photons that actually came uh, from the sun. The sun is like the nemesis of LIDARs. And, and that's uh, our job to try to differentiate between them and there are ways to do it. 
those uh, photons that are converted to electrons through an avalanche reaction of the silicon uh, are collected by the signal processing mechanism. Of course, there is also self noise of the of the detector itself, and it's also uh, part of what we need to do is to uh, see the difference between them. Eventually, uh, light that comes back from the system is detected by the system, but by the unit, and by measuring the time in which it took uh, for the light to bounce back, we know how far things are. Now, eventually, a LiDAR is like a communication system. As you might know, uh, you can define it by a signal-to-noise ratio. The signal-to-noise ratio for LiDARs is defined by the emission, because that's the transmission you, you're using, the aperture of the system, which is the antenna, the photon detection efficiency, uh, which defines the gain of the system, and of course, the noise. The noise that either comes within from the, from the system, <clears throat> or the noise that comes from, uh, from the sun. Now, we use this um, equation uh, to see how we can improve our system from one generation to the other. Between InnoVis 1 and InnoVis 2, our second generation, which we recently showed, we improved this equation by a factor of more than 30 times. Okay, this comes from uh, being able to control different knobs of the system, Using 905 means that we are capped by the amount of laser that we are allowed to use, but we, there are many other uh, measures that we do in order to improve the system significantly. And today, InnoVis 2 is, uh, is a few orders of magnitude really better than uh, any other LiDAR company, any system that is available. I'm showing you an ex a, a demo of InnoVis 2, and this is actually also in a very early stage, but already uh, showing a very nice, um, I would say point cloud, uh, just to get you understanding every point that you see here is a reflection of light coming back from the scene well, after shooting a pulse of light to, and we do that very, very fast in order to cover the entire field of view. And we can see very far away, it's very nice field of view and range and resolution. And, and that is how we solve uh, the problem, uh, which is defined by requirements we get from uh, automakers. Now, autonomous driving is, uh, could be described by different applications, shuttles, trucks, passenger vehicles. Um, those provide different requirements. Uh, for example, passenger vehicles on highway uh, require a certain uh, requirement for driving very fast, uh, but a shuttle that drives in the city uh, with much more complex scenarios and, uh, and, and traffic light and complex uh, intersections require a different set of requirements. Today, uh, I'm going to cover uh, this area, uh, the highway driving. Uh, the highway driving is what we see as the MVP of autonomous driving because uh, it, it actually uh, simplifies uh, and reduces the variance of different use cases that could happen on the road because highways are more uh, alike and and it actually narrows uh, the number of use cases that you need to catch it, it shortens uh, the validation process uh, our lidar can support obviously all of those applications uh, but we see that level two and level three are uh, the, the the opportunities that probably would go the fastest in the market now when a car maker is trying to develop a a, a, a level three, it starts from trying to understand how fast it wants to drive, because the faster the car wants to drive, it, it needs to be able to predict things further ahead. It needs higher resolution, it needs higher frame rate. And, and those are the interpretation of the different uh, requirements from the features of the car into the LiDAR space, uh, which uh, I, this is covered in the white paper and I'm inviting you to read it. Of course, on top of it, uh, there is the design of the vehicle, uh, whether you want to mount it on the roof, in the grill, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the window tilt, they're, they're the cleaning system, there are many things that are from practical uh, elements uh, require some modification for the design of the LiDAR, uh, uh, which we obviously need to take into account. Uh, for those of you that are less familiar with LiDARs, uh, then, you know, obviously a LiDAR is needed to provide redundancy uh, for cameras due to low light condition or, uh, or mist. You can see here an, an example of uh, a, a very simple example of uh, just uh, some 
uh, water uh, that is aggregated on uh, the camera. And of course, uh, every drop of water can create the same uh, problem. And, and that's not, uh, it's not okay to be in this situation. This is why you need to have redundancy. Another case is direct sun. Of course, uh, some might say that if you have sufficient processing power and collected millions of objects, uh, a camera might be enough. But obviously, if, if you're unable to see because of limitation of the physical layer of the, of the sensor, it's not enough. You need to have a secondary sensor that is not sensitive. So um, today we're uh, talking about uh, level three. Level three requirements is, is defined uh, by uh, the ability to see uh, the front of the vehicle uh, mostly. And a good system is not only there to provide safety uh, to, the, to the person, because if, if all the car needs to do is to drive, uh, to, make, to, bring, to make you uh, uh, leave after the, the car travel, it can uh, decide to brake uh, every five minutes. And every, for everything that might happen on the road, it will slow down, uh, you will be exhausted and possibly want to throw up after such a, a drive, which means that uh, the system, in order to be good, it has to be smooth in, in its driving. And to have a smooth driving, you need to be able to predict things uh, very well. And, and in order to do a smooth uh, acceleration, uh, brakes, maneuvers, and that's really what defines uh, the requirements of the sensor. I will not go uh, very deep in these uh, diagrams. These are part of the things that you can find on the white paper, talking about uh, the requirements of the field of view from cutting scenario analysis, uh, and you know whether uh, what whether you place it on the grill or you place it on the roof, uh, how you manage a highway with different curvature, uh, slope, uh, and then you have uh, the vertical field of view that is very much affected by uh, the height of the vehicle and, uh, and, the, and the need to support uh, the ability to see the, the, the ground very well and underdrivable. Uh, again, I don't want to uh, go very deep here, uh, but if you're interested to learn about uh, those principles and how they are translated to the requirements of the liar, again, you can find this on, on a white paper. And actually there is also a lecture which I gave just a month ago about this white paper, it's it's possibly another hour where you need to hear me, uh, but uh, you know uh, I don't do I don't want you to do that twice at least. Um, before we go to the perception area, I think this is possibly something that I do want to uh, dwell on. Eventually, uh, in order to have a good uh, driving, a smooth driving, uh, it's about predicting. It's about being able to uh, classify uh, an object as a person. Uh, knowing that a certain object is a person allows the car to have better prediction of uh, its trajectory and on the way it can actually move in space. If it's a car, there is a certain uh, degree of freedom of how it can move. And the same for a, a bicycle and a person and its velocity. The higher the resolution of the sensor is, it allows you to have a better uh, uh, capability in doing that at a longer range because of course, the longer the person is, you get less pixels on it, less points. So the vertical resolution in this example and the horizontal resolution is key in order to allow the, the sensor to have uh, good capabilities in identifying uh, objects. This talks about uh, the breaking, di oh, the, the frame rate uh, also related to breaking distance. And I don't want to uh, spend time here. It's again, another example of you know, why a certain frame rate is better than the other or why this is enough. I'll, I'll let you read it in the white paper. Uh, this example is something that I do want to spend some time on, sorry. Uh, yeah, here. Okay, so this is a use case we hear a lot from car makers. Uh, you are driving behind a vehicle and there are two vehicles next to you, so you can't move if in case you're seeing a problem. And at some point, this vehicle here identifies an object that he wants to avoid crashing into. And, and, and this use case, it tries to um, provide indication of how fast uh, or how well the car would be able to do emergency braking, assuming that you're driving at 80 miles an hour. Now, imagine uh, that you have an object that is very far away from you, and you want to be able to uh, make a decision 
that this object is non-overdrivable, meaning that it's too high, it's high enough to cause a damage to the car. And basically, uh, this is about 14 centimeters because of the suspension of the vehicle, which cannot absorb a collision into an object that is too high. So the vertical resolution is very important because uh, it's not enough to make a decision on an object because of a single pixel. If you're seeing a single pixel at far away, you don't know if it's a, a, a reflection from the road, a reflection from a bot dot cat eye, uh, or just anything else. You need to have at least two pixels so you have a good clarity that you're looking at something that is uh, tall. And, and therefore the vertical resolution is very important. Once you're able to collect enough frames to identify that at good uh, capability, there is the latency of the vehicle itself in terms of how slow it can eventually uh, uh, stop. Now, this analysis here is trying to show you the sensitivity of, uh, of parameters of the LiDAR. Even if the LiDAR had twice the range capabilities, the ability to see an object at twice the range would not help me because if I only get one pixel, it will not help me to make a decision earlier. If I have higher frame rate, even once I'll see the, the object and start to aggregate frames to make a decision that this is something I worry about, it will only save me about um, six meters of decision, the time in which I collect, start to seeing the object and collecting enough frames to make a decision. It's a very short period, which I will try to save. If I will have double the, the vertical resolution, I will be able to identify this obstacle 100 meters more away. So just to show you the importance of uh, the different parameters of the LiDAR is not very obvious, uh, but are critical to the safety of the vehicle. I will let uh, Amir take it from here. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Omer. Uh, share my screen. Okay, so it took more time than I, than I told you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe while Amir is getting his screen set up, I have a quick question, Omer. Um, yes. How do you, in the company, view um, the, kind of like the evolution of solid state LIDARs? Is this something that's also on Innovis's radar and you want to also develop that kind of technology or, or you believe like the mechanical LIDARs are? The, we have, I mean, our LIDAR is, is a solid state. Our, our, okay. Yeah, it is a solid state. But we are also working on a product. I didn't talk about it. We're also working on a product for a, a 360, uh, but as such that is uh, you know about 10 times the resolution of today available solutions. I mean, the best in class 360 solutions are 128 lines. We are working on a LiDAR with 1,280 lines at a, at a fraction of the price. Uh, we decided to step into that direction because there are still applications that leverage on a wider field of view for uh, non-automotive or uh, non-front looking LIDARs. Uh, and that's something that we announced just, uh, just a month ago and we will show later in the year. Very exciting, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, so thanks Omar once again. Um, so now, now, now we'll speak uh, about how we take this um, uh, OEM uh, requirements, lab certification, and actually build a system to support this reception system. So first, before we dive in, uh, I would like to speak about, um, I think, the most uh, obvious, but yet most important uh, characteristics of, uh, of point cloud, of LiDAR, uh, and that LiDAR is actually measured uh, in 3D, uh, the scene around it. It means uh, that, that each point represents a physical object uh, in, in, the, in the scene. Uh, so uh, it's really easy to measure uh, uh, distance between two points. Uh, it's easy to measure the height of object. It's easier to fit planes uh, to the ground, for example. Um, and, and, and I want, I want to take you um, like through a really simple algorithm uh, and, and we'll see together how far uh, can we go just with LiDAR and really simple algorithm and support uh, much of the requirements Omer, Omer uh, mentioned before. Uh, so, um, the simple algorithm, uh, set, uh, the essence of this simple algorithm is detecting or classifying uh, the collision relevancy of, of each point in the point cloud. Uh, so in this visualization, uh, you can see uh, pink points and, and green points. The pink points are uh, collision relevant points, it means you don't want to drive through them. Uh, and the green points are actually drivable points, in this case, uh, the road. The road. Uh, so the most simple algorithm you can, you can come up with is just take 
every uh, each each pair of points in the point cloud, and if they are close enough, so just measure uh, measure the height difference between these two points, and if it's greater than forty centimeters, like like Pomer says, uh, you can just uh, classify these two points as collision relevant. Uh, so here, this uh, turnover track uh, is uh, is easily detected as uh, as collision relevant, uh, and and the car won't drive through this track. Um, so while I'm talking about uh, deep learning network, uh, it, it's really easy to, uh, it's really hard uh, to generalize uh, deep learning networks to new examples, to new scenarios. Uh, so you can have a really good uh, deep learning network that detects cars, trucks, pedestrians, whatever, uh, but then you get this Santa uh, on the road, uh, and it's not trivial uh, to, um, to generalize and, and to understand this Santa uh, as actually an object which you want to avoid and not just, just the background. Uh, and, and with point cloud, like with this really, really simple algorithm, uh, this task become uh, really easy. Uh, another example just is fire trucks, uh, maybe uh, and, and ambulances and, and other, um, other cars which are not uh, represented um, uh, sufficiently in, in the train set. Uh, and you probably heard about accidents that uh, might uh, be to similar reasons. Uh, and another but, but related uh, case is, is, is a completely different scenario. I mean, um, most of the data tends to be uh, from, from places like uh, North America or Europe, uh, but then you can end up uh, in, uh, in India, uh, in a city full of rickshaws, and, and you just want to make sure you never collide them. Um, so, so again, with LiDAR and, and this really simple algorithm I, I described before, this problem, uh, it still exists, obviously, uh, but it's, it's suppressed uh, and it's under control once you can actually measure the scene. So now let's look a little bit more uh, concrete example. Maybe some of you recognize this, uh, this video from, uh, from one of the Tesla crashes. Uh, so you can see the white Tesla um, actually crash into this, uh, this turn of the trucks. Uh, so there are many reasons for, for this crash. Uh, some say it's lighting, uh, other maybe uh, because, uh, um, because during training, uh, the, the, the network never seen a turn, turn of a truck, so it might, might be a problem. Um, but, but as, as Omer says, and, and, and as I, I mentioned before, with LiDAR, uh, this, this whole accident would be, would be avoided. So you can see here, um, this is how, how it would look in LiDAR. Um, so the truck is easily easily detected from, from really really far, um, and and the car would, would never would never actually crash this this vehicle. Um, and and this this algorithm is the same algorithm uh, as I described before. So really really simple algorithm that actually um, um, make, makes all, all the safety critical scenarios much more solid and and under control. So maybe some of you guys saying that. Uh, Detecting this huge truck is, is easy. So here's a different example uh, from, from our actual LiDAR. This is the end of this one. Uh, look at the distance uh, to, I don't know if you guys can see, uh, a, a, a tire. Uh, this at the distance this is a tire. Um, so this same really simple algorithm, just looking at two points, uh, one above the other, can easily uh, detect this tire as a, as, as a collision relevant. So what the car actually sees uh, the car just take uh, the, the collision relevant point and maybe project them on, on, on a X, Y plane, like on, on the ground plane or something, uh, and use this information to, um, to navigate through the many other obstacles uh, in the scene. Uh, and this is like just a close up, just so you can see this is really, uh, really a, a tire and, a, and, a, and actually a pallet next to the, next to the tire that uh, cannot be seen from distance. Um, but, but as Oma mentioned before, it, it's not enough. I mean, uh, get a good understanding of the static object in the scene, uh, small obstacles, big obstacles, is really important, safety critical, but it's not enough because uh, eventually uh, we want to understand uh, where these objects are going. Um, maybe they're moving in, in our velocity, uh, so we don't need to do anything, just be aware, uh, or maybe uh, they're going to enter our ego lane, so we need to break. Um, so, so still detecting an object as an object is, is really important. So let's take this example, uh, just, just pedestrian detection. This is actually a pedestrian captured by, uh, by the LIDAR. So, I, and I think everybody, everybody would agree this is, this is an easy example, right? Um, it is expected from, from every uh, average network to say, uh, this is actually a pedestrian and classified as a pedestrian. But what, what about this example? Uh, I mean, 
here it's not it's not obvious anymore, right? Uh, I mean, maybe you can see legs, a little bit of head, torso, but it's it's not it's not obvious. So, but but still, I think a good trained uh, network or system can still say this is a pedestrian giving its surrounding and maybe a little more context. Um, so, so here again, it's expected uh, expected to, to, to be detected and classified as pedestrian. But what about these two points? These two points, really distant points. Um, so now, now a vehicle is moving really fast, and we want to be super aware of any anything, even even if it's it's a high high distance. So, what 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 can we do? What what do we expect uh, from uh, from deep learning network or that, that look at the appearance of the object? Um, it's it's really I think everybody agrees. It's really hard to say this is a pedestrian, uh, but with lidar, luckily, uh, it's not it's not critical. I mean, we can still uh, classify or, or cluster uh, these two points as a, as an object because we know they are close by, uh, and if we classify it as an object, and now we have a bounding box, we can keep track uh, and and uh, and estimates all the other attributes like velocity, shape, uh, position, obviously, all that needed. Uh, for the car to to predict uh, its its uh, its motion and and act uh, accordingly. So taking this simple, uh, really simple uh, clustering algorithm and, and putting on put it on real real scenario like a normal highway drive. Uh, so so it would look uh, roughly like this. Um, you can see many many clusters of of actual cars and objects um, around uh, with zero uh, sin semantic. Uh, but since we don't have the systematic, you 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 would also see also see um, like uh, other objects which are not relevant uh, necessarily for driving because they're not moving, uh, classified uh, or not classified detected as uh, as objects. Uh, but if our tracking system is good enough, we would say, okay, this is an object. I don't know what is it, but it's stationary. So uh, just don't drive into it, but don't worry, it will never cross your lane. Um, so you can you can go really far with these two simple algorithms, just uh, pair point collision relevant and, and clustering. You can really go far uh, with uh, uh, with perception task for autonomous driving. But now the question: Is it enough? I mean, is, is it enough to, to really create a system which is robust and useful for the upper level to stack? So here's an example uh, where this cluster mechanism is not perfect. Um, what, what you see here, you see in uh, blue, uh, is, uh, is actually deep learning network. This is the first time I'm showing uh, like deep learning results. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, the blue is, is deep learning network which detects this, this whole um, object as a truck. Uh, but unfortunately, the cluster mechanism actually split it into two different objects um, and, and, and reported if we use just the cluster mechanism, we would report it as two different objects. Uh, so you, you can imagine uh, this, this ambiguity or, or instability uh, of the cluster mechanism actually make it a little bit harder uh, for, for the upper layers of the stack to get a good understanding of what it's in. Uh, and if you're not classified as a truck, so the motion model is not, is not clear. Um, and, and again, the upper uh, layer of the autonomous vehicle stuff, as uh, truck, uh, autonomous vehicle uh, stack, uh, can't be sure which uh, how how this uh, uh, object will will behave. Uh, so so semantic uh, is is still important and, and, and still critical uh, for for this full full system. Um, so now let's see how how we can do uh, deep learning uh, on on point cloud. So first thing we need to we need to decide we need to decide how should we represent the data. So now point cloud as it sounds is just a set of points. Uh, so the first thing we need to uh, need to understand while processing point cloud is that it's unstructured. It means if we took all the points of, of on this car and, and order it differently in the memory, it will still be the same car. It will still be the exact same scene. Uh, so uh, there are actually uh, deep learning architecture which take advantage take advantage of this, like a uh, point net or point net plus. Uh, but but. For sure, this is not standard, and, and we need to make sure we understand this before, before processing the data. Another characteristic which is important and, and, and we need to consider is the sparsity uh, of, of point cloud. Uh, if you're looking at point cloud at the Cartesian coordinate system, and uh, this visualization is looking from, from the top, uh, so you would see that most of the points are concentrated in, in, in the beginning of the scene uh, because we sample the world in spheric coordinate system. Um, so uh, this this again um, 
um, challenge uh, some of the architecture, but actually some other architectures uh, actually can leverage uh, from, this, from these characteristics and, uh, and create much more efficient networks. And, and this efficiency uh, with computation, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna speak about it through this talk because uh, on, on autonomous driving and in general uh, processing on the edge, computational efficiency, efficiency is a key element and sometimes actually defines the solution. So it's really important uh, to make sure your algorithms are efficient. Um, another presentation now, which is structured, okay, uh, like images is front view. Uh, so you can see the camera image, just normal camera image above, and below a point cloud, uh, which are projected on the on the ladder itself. So uh, it looks like uh, it looks like an image. Uh, the only difference is that each point here has some has different attributes. It has the reflectivity, as you can see here, but it also has um, it also has the the um, the XYZ position relative to the sensor. Um, so now, now the, the data is structured and we can apply uh, many legacy networks that uh, I guess you are aware of or, or been made aware of during this course uh, and leverage from, from a lot of legacy. Uh, but, but now it's a little bit harder to exploit the trigger measurement uh, characteristic of point cloud. Uh, for instance, even though we know this car and this car are roughly the same size uh, and same shape roughly, uh, while looking at it uh, from uh, front view, uh, it's a little bit hard to use this advantage. And now we get a lot of scale uh, per, per distance, and this is uh, uh, kind of uh, increasing uh, the data set uh, that we need, uh, we need to, uh, to use in order to, to have a good generalization. But this is useful representation. Another representation, which is also common uh, while processing uh, point cloud is voxelization. Uh, so, uh, if we take all the volume uh, we want to process and predict uh, road users, so estimate road users location, uh, and we split it into uh, multiple uh, smaller volumes, uh, like you can see here, this is the, the visualization I'll try to, uh, try to give here. And in each voxel, uh, just uh, put a representation of the points in it or in the surrounding, uh, then we can get, a, uh, again, a structured representation of the point clone. Um, and in each voxel, we can, we can start with really simple representation, like occupancy, uh, whether it has points in it or not, uh, or we can go uh, for much uh, more complex representations, uh, like statistics, uh, even a small network that actually um, um, estimate the best representation of each, each voxel, and there is a lot of research um, about it. So here is a, here is a, an example uh, for for this uh, voxelization uh, representation. So this is the voxel, the voxelized map uh, looking from the top. Okay, so uh, it's, a, it's an image, um, and each uh, each voxel uh, is uh, represented by by the reflectivity of the center uh, of the center point. Uh, and I put here uh, give you just some angles so you can uh, associate uh, these two two pictures. Uh, so, but by the way, this is really coarse uh, representation. Uh, mostly, it's, uh, it's much better. Um, so you can see how how the network uh, might might see. Uh, but but now we we lost uh, um, maybe a key uh, a key information that that we have if we look for uh, at the point cloud from the front view. Now it's a little bit harder to understand uh, um, what which object occludes which object. For instance, this break uh, in the guardrail. Uh, it's a little bit harder to understand that this break is actually due to this car um, and, and not just due to a break uh, in, the, in the guardrail. Uh, so in order to do this again, we need to build uh, a network with greater receptive field uh, and a little bit more deeper network to get a, a deeper understanding of the scene. And, and sometimes, as I said before, we want to avoid it. We want to still be uh, as efficient as possible. But once again, luckily with point cloud, uh, it is still easy uh, to get all this uh, occlusion information. Uh, so what you can see here, this is an example of, of an occlusion map. So all the white uh, is non-occluded point cloud. Uh, so if you take this clustering mechanism and just, uh, just color uh, all the free space, uh, you would get this occlusion map. So, so you can add this occlusion map as an extra layer uh, for the network. So it has this information in advance and you don't need to, to create really big, fat networks in order to understand this, uh, yeah, these occlusions. So now after we know how to represent data with deep learning and 
we picked our uh, favorite uh, architecture. Um, the question is, what, what, are, what are the key elements? What we want to achieve uh, with the full system? So if we take the, the cutting use case uh, Omar mentioned, um, we want to make sure this uh, motorcycle is not in our lane. We want to make sure we never crash into this motorcycle. Uh, so first, we need to detect it with the LiDAR, and luckily, our LiDAR is, is good enough uh, for, for detection of this motorcycle. It has a um, large enough uh, field of view. Uh, and then you want to put a bounding box around it, right? Uh, so you can um, tell to the car where it's located, where it's going. You can, you can track it. Uh, but now it's really critical that this uh, bounding box is, is, is really tight uh, on this object, right? Because if we just missed by a few centimeters, in this case, to the right, uh, we might think that this, this motorcycle is actually not in our lane and there's no problem because you can just keep going and it might crash, crash the motorcycle. Uh, so we want to get really good accuracy uh, with, with bonding boxes, with object detection. Um, so if, if we take this uh, voxel to presentation uh, of, of the field of view, now, now we have a problem because on one hand, we want to get really dense and uh, really fine grid uh, in order to, uh, to be much more accurate and, and and to, to reduce the ambiguity uh, between the center of the cell and, and the actual object uh, in it. Uh, but as I said before, uh, it is computationally expensive. expensive. So uh, we want to still find a way to work with uh, reduced representations, uh, but achieve this, this, uh, this accuracy. Um, so a possible solution is a fusion between the deep learning approach and the classical approach, the leverage uh, the best from, from each approach to, to create a solid uh, object list for, for the upper left of the stack. Uh, so uh, this deep learning uh, stream gives you the, uh, the semantics. It can say where the, roughly where the object starts, where it ends. Um, uh, is, it, is it a classified object? Is it the car? Is it the pedestrian, motorcycle? Um, and, and the clustering stream actually gives you the accuracy. Uh, that you need in order to drive and drive the car safely. Uh, so, so this is this is an example of how it looks. So, we, again, in, in blue, this is the deep learning, and, and uh, in, in white, this is the clustering. So you can see the deep learning. No, this is a car, and actually put a bounding box around around the car, but it's not accurate enough. It's few centimeters off, and, and these few centimeters are important uh, for for the safety critical objects, objects which are close by. Um, and, and the clustering actually really good. Uh, it fits really good uh, the object itself. So once we did this, uh, we actually uh, gain one more uh, one more thing, which is again, again important in safety critical systems. And this part, the clustering, uh, the clustering path and the fusion is fully uh, interpretable path, uh, and it's really helped to get uh, to root cause of problems and look at the system as a white box. So we can understand exactly what it does. Um, and, and, and in some cases, this is, this is important. It's really useful that you have a safety path, which is fully interpretable. So this is how it all kind of uh, adds up. Uh, so this is uh, the deep learning output. You can see the bounding box. You can see them a little bit shaky. Not all the objects are fully, fully detected all the time. Uh, this is the clustering uh, output, uh, so you can see it's solid, uh, but you have many false positives and the object length is not predicted and you don't know which object is it, obviously. Uh, and this is the fused, uh, the fused output, so you can kind of get the best from, from everything. You, you have uh, uh, classes, uh, you have bounding boxes which are pretty solid, uh, and, and it's, it's really helpful uh, for, for, again, for the upper layers of the stack. So I know I know I moved fast uh, because I didn't have much time, um, but uh, but this is it. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank yeah, you so I'm, much. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to answer some questions in the meantime. Uh, if you want, I can uh, answer some of them. Or uh, I think that maybe one thing that uh, it was it is important for me to to add because there was a question. Uh, Innovis is not developing. A, an autonomous vehicle, meaning that we're not developing the driving decision. We are developing the LiDAR and the perception software, which allows car makers to have a more seamless integration. Assume uh, that uh, the processing uh, unit of the car maker has a certain 
uh, input from the camera, an object detection classification uh, uh, interface, and they are just getting another one from another sensor. And you can imagine that they don't really care if it's a LiDAR or not. All they care is that that secondary uh, interface, which tells them where things are, uh, is, is in redundant to the other and gives them higher confidence in certain uh, conditions. So we're not developing, so we are not uh, doing driving decision, but we are aiding uh, our customers. Um, do, do you want to ask specific questions? Do you want me to go over questions that came up and you know maybe choose one of those? Uh, thanks. Oh, uh, yeah, either one is, is perfectly fine. Or if anyone else has other questions, feel free to just jump in okay. and ask. Sure. Uh, someone asked me about weather condition. Um, although it's less related to perception, maybe um, anyway, uh, quickly on that, uh, rain is actually not very affecting uh, LIDARs because a drop of water is almost meaningless in terms of how much light is reflected back when you're you know, meeting a, a drop of water in mid air. And even if very, with very uh, dense rain, it's, uh, it's only re reducing possibly a few percentages of range. Uh, fog is like an ex extrapolation of rain Imagine a very large volume of particles that each one of them by itself reflects uh, light back. So it creates attenuation of the light going through. It doesn't blind it completely, but it does reduce it uh, quite significantly. Depends on the density, of course. Um, there was a question here. Let me just check. Um, so when we, someone asked about uh, false positive, et cetera, or actually there is another question I prefer. Someone asked me um, what's, uh, how, what, uh, what makes our LiDAR possibly uh, a better fit uh, to this application uh, compared to others. So beyond, of course, the obvious of cost and size, which I think are important for automotive. Um, if you would follow the white paper, you would see that there are really, um, there is a trade-off between different uh, parameters. It's very important not to fall in love with only one uh, because just again, we talked about range in this example, just seeing like doing a LIDAR that sees one kilometer with a single uh, laser pointer is uh, obviously, you can say you have a LIDAR that sees one kilometer and you can probably uh, spark it and, and, and raise a lot of money, uh, but eventually it will not help uh, autonomous vehicles. So there is there are many parameters and I think what, what Innovis is doing uh, well is the private system that has a very nice working point and tradable, meaning that we can actually, we, we, we can trade between parameters, but the working point, the, the overall SNR that we have in our system is significantly higher, which allows us to meet uh, all of the parameters uh, that we show in that uh, document, including resolution, frame rate. It's not only resolution, it's also frame rate, it's also field of view, and, and of course, range. So it's not, and of course there is a pricing. So that's, uh, I think the white paper explains it uh, probably better than me. Um, there is a question here on classif classifiers. Amir, maybe this is for you. Is it possible yeah. in theory to uh, rig the loss function of the classifier to be more, or oh, oh, maybe that was a joke actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I could. <laughs> there, is, there, is, there are two relevant questions. One is the first positive and the other one is training. I can take, take two of them. Um, so, so let, let's start with the training. Uh, I think uh, I think we have two major concerns uh, in, in training. Uh, one, which is related directly to the training, is and uh, and it's um, sampling uh, the most beneficial samples uh, for annotation. Uh, I think, uh, like especially uh, in in autonomous driving, especially on highway, uh, most of the scenes, especially in North America and. and uh, and in Europe, most of the scene is, is just identical. Uh, so we won't get much uh, from just uh, sampling uh, random uh, random frames uh, for the training. Uh, and we actually built a system of, of active learning. Uh, and I've described it in previous talks, so you can, you can look it up online. Um, so um, so this is really like a key element uh, at Innovis, like uh, yeah. uh, make sure- Th there, is a, there is a question here. Oh, sorry. Make sure, make sure um, you say. Do we have another one? I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I think there might be a little bit of flag. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe we have time for one more question if there's one more. 
There's someone to ask me a question here about uh, the different types of lidars, uh, FMCW and time of flight. And it's actually, th there, are, there are different camps in the LIDAR space. You have the, the wavelength camp, 905, 1550. That's kind of a big kind of discussion. And then you have uh, the laser modulation, whether it's time of flight and FMCW. And I think other than that, you have the scanning mechanism, like whether it's mechanical, solid state, or I don't know, optical phase array. So th those are the prim primarily the, the, the three main kind of uh, branches in, in the market. Uh, starting with the question of FMCW and, and time of flight. So uh, the only benefits uh, proclaimed by the FMCW is the ability to do uh, direct measurement of velocity, meaning it's, it's, you modulate the laser in a certain way uh, that allows you to measure uh, both range and velocity by measuring Doppler. Very similar on how you do it with radars. The only uh, thing that the disadvantages comes with the need to use 1550, and again, very expensive. Uh, and there is a very strong coupling between uh, the range, frame rate, and field of view. So the trade, the working point there is quite limited. So FMCW systems can reach around uh, 200K samples a second. Uh, Innovis 1 is about 7 mega uh, samples per second. And Innovis 2, it's uh, even significantly higher. And it means that when you need to trade between resolution, number of points, uh, frame, frame rate, and field of view, FMCW uh, mostly is using a very, very narrow periscope kind of um, uh, LIDARs because of that limitation. And eventually measuring the, the velocity of the vehicle in FMCW is, is only uh, possible in the longitude uh, uh, vector because you're measuring velocity in the vector of the, of the light uh, direction. You cannot measure velocity in the lateral, which is as important. So the need to calculate velocity is there anyway. Uh, with time of flight, you can uh, calculate velocity very nice. If you have very high resolution and high frame rate, it's not uh, less uh, well. And eventually, uh, when it comes to the trade-off between parameters, uh, definitely resolution, range, field of view, frame rate comes on top of the requirement for velocity. And seeing probably tens of RFIs and RFQs in the market, I haven't seen yet anyone asking for velocity really. So uh, the, the, the value there is, I think, very limited and comes with very high cost. Um, Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so thank you both so much. And maybe one more quick question. I know car makers are probably your primary customer, but uh, I was wondering, do you also send, sell your sensor to uh, others beyond the car makers? For example, academia and universities doing autonomous driving research. Do you know someone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, we do. Uh, right. And we're happy to work with teams uh, that are trying to innovate. Uh, and of course, we can talk about it after this session. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, but just yes, curious. I mean, uh, we, yes, of course. I mean, we, we work with construction uh, companies, mm -hmm. smart cities, surveillance. I mean, look, today, every, in every corner of the world, you have a 2D camera somewhere. We live in a 3D world. Okay, uh, anything you might ever want to automate, you would prefer to use a 3D sensor. It gives you much faster capability, uh, ability to exercise an application. I'm sure LIDARs would be in the same position in uh, several years from today. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you both for, for your presentation today.